improving your student course and teacher evaluations. The final session in the virtual 2020 Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health annual meeting. My name's Liz Weist. I'm ASP Peach's Director of Education. We're glad so many of you could be with us today. Instead of using the Q&A box, we're enabling the chat feature for you to weigh in and answer the six topic questions that our presenters have for you. To do so, you look at the chat bar at the bottom of your screen, click on the icon there, and the box will pop up, and type in your reaction to the message box that you see here. I'm excited to introduce your lineup for today's event. All three speakers are members of the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health Scholarship of Teaching and Learning Task Force, and they're members of the Course and Evaluation Working Group. Your moderator today is Dr. Allie Weinstein, Associate Professor in the Department of Global and Community Health at the George Mason University College of Health and Human Services. She chairs the working group that authored the report that you're gonna hear about today. She co-authored section three, factors that affect student course and teacher evaluations. Dr. Matt Hyatt is professor of biostatistics and serves as the associate dean for in the Department of Population and Health Sciences at the Georgia State School of Public Health. He co-wrote section five of the report. Dr. Ella Austin is Associate Professor and serves as the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs at the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. And she co-wrote section one of the report, Student Course and Teacher Evaluations. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Dr. Ali Weinstein. Hi, thank you. We're very excited to be able to share this time with all of you. And so thank you for logging on with us. Um, and what we're going to be discussing today is we're going to, what I'm going to do is, is uh, talk to you a bit about what the um, objectives are for the session. Um, so if I could have the next slide. So we're gonna, I'm gonna spend a little time at the beginning describing the conclusions of the student course and teacher evaluation working report. Um, and then uh, we're going to state how we're gonna talk and state how course and teacher evaluations can be improved. And then finally, we're gonna discuss, and this is where we're gonna spend a lot of our time discussing how student course evaluations can be used more effectively um, in p and promotion and tenure, CIF accreditation, and for improving instructional effectiveness in general. So before we get started, I just wanted to acknowledge all of the members of the working group. You're going to hear from three of us today, but there were more members, as you can see from the slide, and everyone put in a lot of work to create the report. So I just wanted to say thank you to all of the members of the working group. So the, um, what I'm going to do to sort of frame our discussion today is just give some of the highlights of the report that has now been published. And you can see here on the screen, the full report can be found um, on the website. And um, it, it, what we really tried to do was take a state of the literature. What do we know? What are our, our where are, are we currently in terms of course and teacher evaluations? Um, and so what the report really helps us do is recognize the limitations of these student course and teacher evaluations. Um, and the limitations come for many reasons, but partly because they reflect opinions and perceptions of students. And they're really not measures of teaching effectiveness nor student learning. They were originally not intended to serve these purposes, but since they are so easy to collect and use, people have started using them as markers of effectiveness and student learning. In order to assess teaching effectiveness, we really need to do it separately from student experience. So these end of the semester student course and teacher evaluations are really opinions and perceptions of the students from their experience. These are really important and we don't, we don't want to discount that we should be collecting them, but they are not measures of teaching effectiveness nor student learning. 
So um, part of what the report really tried to put forth was the idea of not being limited by what your university school and or department are currently using. So just because we sort of have to do those end of the semester course evaluations doesn't necessarily mean um, that that's the only thing we can use. So we can supplement with more um, evidence-based types of markers. So no single tool is going to fix all of those issues that I just talked about. So we have to learn to use a, a, a mix of learning assessments to really adequately get at the complexity of teaching and learning. So it's, it's unfortunately no magic pill here that we're gonna have. So the other limitation that we found so far is that the research in course and teacher evaluation specifically within our field of public health is actually quite limited. So a lot of the report drew from other related fields, but not within public health itself. And there are some special circumstances to think about in public health. Um, you know, and if you think of graduate programs, we're training um, practitioners a lot of times and the regular sort of end of semester evaluations don't fit those types of courses very well. When we're thinking about undergraduates, public health is this very broad field Field and students will have different interests. So again, a student interest tends to change their perception of the class. So uh, we really need some more work being done specifically in the field of public health. But the report really, what it does is it provides a good jumping off point, right? So it gives us a sort of state of where we are right now. But what we really want to talk about today and with all of you is how do we right now improve course and teacher evaluations yes we want to engage in research and we want to improve them through evidence-based practice but are there things that we can implement now that will help us while we wait for those excellent research studies to be conducted hopefully by some of you so Today's plan is an interactive discussion. So I just wanted to, to make sure everyone was aware, this is not gonna be your typical session where sort of the three of us talk at you and we have prepared slides to provide you information. Because I just let you know, we don't have the answers to these tough questions right now. So what we're hoping to do today is have a nice interactive discussion using the chat box and then Ella and Matt and myself will help sort of lead this discussion, uh, announce thoughts that are coming in through the chat session because we wanna teach each other. We're gonna be learning from you. You're hopefully gonna be learning from some of our experiences, but right now what we need is to hear what things are working where you are and what are your challenges and can we get suggestions for those challenges? So we're really excited to have this interactive um, of time together today. So I get to jump off. We're all gonna sort of take turns leading the different um, discussion points. So um, topic one has to do with reducing bias in current assessment. So um, just to provide a little bit of background, one of the issues, if, if you've read the report, or you're gonna read the report, is that these end of the semester course and teacher evaluations are, are, can, be, can be actually quite biased. Um, so if you have looked at the reports, many things can cause reduction in scores, um, gender, um, topic area, size of classes, um, rank of the professor, the instructor, anything that sort of points at people's perceptions will cause some bias in questions. So what can we do now? We know we, we use these questions and that's what is currently used. How can we reduce bias in the questions currently being asked? So what we're going to do is, is um, as the slide is coming up, is showing you, we're going to use the chat box. So if you have any ideas or, or questions, but um, if you have any ideas about what, what can we do to try to reduce the bias that we see in course and teacher, the questions being asked in those end of semester um, or the process being used at the end of the semester. So, um, and, and what we're gonna do is, because we're using the chat box, is we're gonna sort of repeat the comments and questions that we're seeing so we can all be on the same page. Um, and we have a, an interesting thought coming through, you know, would a compared to make a difference? So again, instead of um, sort of typically 80% uh, um, ish of the questions are sort of these Likert scales, um, how much did you learn in the class? Very little to very much. So maybe trying to anchor people's opinions and thoughts could be a useful technique. Um, 
So, uh, so that's one way. Again, I think thinking about ways in which we can anchor opinions could be really important. Um, but it is tough to do that with the diversity of courses that we see. Um, I think in terms of compared to one of the things we did to notice was that if we let the students know that their opinions were really respected and that the evaluations were looked at and were used um, in, in ways to improve future classes, they actually showed a bit of a reduction in the bias that we've seen otherwise. Um, thought came in, a, students expect female professors to be nurturing. How do we reduce gender bias? So that is a quadrillion dollar question. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure that we're gonna be able to um, reduce gender bias, but what I think we can do is potentially um, is, is try to get questions away from opinion questions. So, right, we're all, we're stuck. I'm gonna say stuck. We're stuck with what the questions were given, but there is usually, um, there was a survey that was conducted among, this, among schools and programs of public health that there are open-ended questions that, that faculty members can actually fill in on their own. And those questions, you could use less biased language, less opinion language, and more uh, questions about the content and delivery of the class, which then reduces bias. Part of the reason that this gender bias, I think, tends to rise so much is because the questions are, are worded in opinion um, and perceptions rather than in actual student experience. Um, I have a really interesting thought here about the idea about putting language in the instructions that acknowledge that bias um, occurs and ask students to be aware of their own biases that might be influencing their responses. I think that's a really nice idea, a nice thought in terms of, of framing and this again sort of providing an anchor um, to, to the um, students. Um, and this is a really good point as well that's coming in uh, about using questions that are open-ended which tend to, to relieve a little bit of the sort of check off box bias that can occur so that you can actually get people to give more depth to their answer. So again, um, that's a really, really nice way to get around it. Um, another suggestion was using mid-semester evaluation. So again, mid-semester evaluations are really nice because again, it shows that you have the um, interest um, student, you have interest in getting student feedback and actually putting it into practice potentially. Um, Allie, there was also an interesting question. I think that you missed about um, should administration be before or after the grade of the time, which is a really good point here. That is a really good point. I mean, uh, I, I think I have, uh, I'm a psychologist by training, so I can see both sides of the story almost every time. But I, again, I think we, we tend to want to do them before final grades or before sort of that anger of final grade, grades can kind of, her. Um, so lots of really good thoughts and comments are sort of coming in the chat, which I appreciate. Um, we're not going to be able to get to everyone. Um, so hopefully at the end, we might have some time, but I'm going to hand it over to Matt, who's going to take us to our next topic. Great. Thanks, Ali. Um, uh, I wanted to talk about um, I mean, related to bias, are there some ideas for ways to augment traditional evaluations to uh, do something differently? And, and we have a few ideas that we described in the report. And interestingly, some of the comments touched on these. One idea is midterm uh, feedback, which is really helpful because it allows for mid-course corrections midway through the semester. And um, it can also be very useful for individual faculty as you're teaching to inform um, how things are going in the class and make any sort of, you know, corrections and changes. And there's even been a pilot study a few years ago uh, that showed students participating in midterm feedback opportunities reported increases in their learning and satisfaction. So this is one interesting idea. Another is mixed methods evaluation approaches. And uh, so uh, one example of this would be doing like a, an end of term focus group with the students and maybe your last class session to get some feedback about how the class went and so forth. And also using pre and post course student surveys and, and other structured sort of procedures. And 
I mean, one of the challenges with this is that these approaches necessitate additional class time and really need to be carefully planned. And instructor self-reflection, um, in, in a few minutes, um, Eli is going to talk about uh, teacher portfolios, which is another idea with this. So, um, yeah, so a question I have there um, for you related to this is, um, how can we use other approaches and are there other approaches? What other approaches have you used? But uh, do they improve validity? And by validity, I mean, are we capturing what we think we're capturing? Are we measuring teacher effectiveness? Uh, is there a way to go beyond student opinions and perceptions here? And um, yeah, so if, we'd love to hear what sort of things you've been doing and your thoughts about this. Yeah, and so one, one comment that was just made, peer observation and evaluation. Peer feedback is absolutely another sort of alternative form that I'm gonna talk about in a few minutes, um, a little bit later in my talk. So we'll definitely touch on that. That can be very valuable. Um, faculty reflections are the most valuable tool I have as a program director to plan faculty retreats on themes expressed by the faculty. Um, Absolutely. Um, I think, um, you know, the idea of instructor self-reflection, putting together, you know, faculty putting together a, a, a professional teaching portfolio that includes experiences, accomplishments, um, skills, and also reflects back on learning that's occurred as a result of teaching. So, how do you measure instructor effectiveness if the faculty feel that they are doing everything correct? That is a really good question. Um, sometimes, you know, student opinions and perceptions can certainly um, inform that to some extent. That's a very challenging topic. Um, I found that asking students open-ended questions about what they've learned gives me the most useful information Student reflections are very helpful. I can tell you if they got it. And, and when I read that, one thing that comes to mind is this idea around pre and post assessment and measuring something at the beginning of the semester and seeing if it's changed at the end and maybe going beyond just knowledge of the topic. Years ago, the teaching clinic approach to traction identified experts who have no authority or supervisory responsibility for the faculty. The interest is pure on teaching, learning, improvement. That's a very interesting idea to have sort of a, uh, someone who's focused on um, teaching effectiveness without necessarily content expertise. Um, and I'll talk again in a few minutes about peer feedback because I think that's also a very important possibility here for, for adding to validity of assessing and measuring teaching effectiveness. Other questions or thoughts or comments? Is it possible to measure student learning? Hmm. What do you mean by that, Ali? Oh, if I ask a question, that means I have to talk again, right? Um, so I just meant, you know, so we talk a lot about measuring student learning, and I think some of us think, uh, you know, a final exam or, or something like that might measure student learning, but just like what you were saying, that I thought that's why I was so thoughtful when you said pre-post measurements, because just a grade at the end of the semester or a grade on a paper doesn't really tell us what they learned. What we want to show is even if they, let's say, got a, you know, got half the questions right on the final exam, but at the beginning of the semester, they would have gotten no questions right. A lot of learning went on there. Um, but I, I think I, I've enjoyed seeing um, comments about the um, open-ended types of, of um, assignments or rating uh, open-ended feedback that can really help this. So, you know, a, a multiple choice exam doesn't give us a lot of ideas, but potentially some open-ended um, understanding questions will really show whether the students have have developed an understanding that they didn't have coming into the class. Mm -hmm. And I think Matt actually it, that it's just about time to move on to the next topic actually.
Great. So I think Ella's going to talk to us a little bit about teaching portfolios. So. Yes. So as we were, you know, thinking about this presentation, um, you know, a lot of the focus was on how we can improve uh, measures of teaching and course uh, or course and teacher evaluations. And, you know, so Ali's talked about how can we reduce bias and Matt talked about um, how might we use a more holistic approach. I also wanted us to think about how we can actually use the assessments that we have and we've had lots of great ideas um, posited already today about different types of assessments that we might have. I wanted us to also spend some time thinking about how we can use those assessments for ourselves as faculty when we start thinking about things like promotion and tenure. You know, obviously our goal in thinking critically about assessing courses and teachers is to improve educational quality. And part of what I think we're trying to do in these assessments is bring visibility to educational quality. And so I wanted us to start to think about sort of the next step of how we can use these assessments um, you know, for ourselves to demonstrate the things that we're doing to try to uh, improve educational quality. So that is the question for topic three, what additional approaches can we use uh, that can be included in teaching portfolios? Um, for those of us that uh, develop teaching portfolios for things like promotion and tenure, how can we bring in both the standard end of the semester, you know, student rating of faculty, what else can we add that is going to better uh, reflect uh, student uh, achievement and student learning. So that's something for us to think about now. So Ella, while everyone's getting a chance to type a little bit, um, yeah. I, I have, I've had an opportunity um, at my university to, to sit on um, um, some of the teaching award winning um, committees. And I've seen a lot of development of sort of electronic teaching portfolios where people are actually submitting their taped lectures or submitting a website that they've created. Do you, do you see that fitting in here? Absolutely. I think anything that demonstrates um, the ways that we engage with our courses, I mean, the, the most obvious way is to read the evaluation and say, oh, well, they liked that or, oh, they didn't like that. That's one way of engaging students to um, reflect on our courses and our teaching strategies. But I think anything else that allows people to see what it is that we do. So much of the teaching that we do is really invisible to people outside of our classroom. And so thinking critically about ways that we can um, bring visibility to what we do. So I would say that not only would including things like um, examples of uh, you know, videos or um, other documentation, but having uh, faculty actually provide a narrative that explains how that's a demonstration of the pedagogical approaches that they use, of how they attempt to really engage uh, students in learning. So I think that just adding additional materials to teaching portfolios is one step, but also going that additional step of reflecting on that and uh, helping others to see how the feedback that is received from students, how the things that we do every day in the classroom, how that continually sort of in a you know, quality improvement uh, framework contributes to continued uh, work toward educational, you know, high quality education and best practices education. Uh, let's see what some of the chats are saying. Allie, thank you for, um, for, for weighing in on that. Um, so there's a question here, and this is something that I think we could engage on. What are some techniques or software that people are using for these electronic teaching portfolios that Allie was talking about? 
Um, and let's see, these are some long comments. Okay. Um, another suggestion was having student reflections on course content. And another vote for interactive sessions with students and create informal sessions asking for honest responses from students. So this ties into what uh, Matt was talking about earlier about using sort of a um, mixed methods, uh, holistic approach. So actually really engaging students and asking for honest feedback um, and have differing ways for students to provide that feedback, recognizing that some might be shy uh, or concerned about um, speaking up with their concerns. All right, other ideas of how we can contribute to teaching portfolios in ways that demonstrate how we're taking student information and using it to improve. And Elle, I'm sorry to interrupt you. There, there was one at the beginning that I think okay. might be interesting. Uh, yes. It says, any unique considerations for adjuncts, either to maintain position or move to full-time faculty? So maybe you can weigh on that, in on that one and then we'll move to the next topic. Absolutely, yeah. So I, you know, obviously people in different positions, um, you know, the, the consequences are, are different. So I think that figuring out how to use teaching portfolios to really reflect the ways that faculty are responding to constructive criticism that, that students might provide and using it to continue to refine their pedagogical approaches, to refine their materials, these sorts of things. So I think the, the big takeaway is really just this idea of being responsive to student concerns and demonstrating how you're taking student um, evaluations of the course into consideration. That doesn't mean we you know, do whatever students tell us to do, but that we're being um, critical and responsive to what students are telling us about courses and our um, uh, skills as instructors. And now I'm going to turn it back to Matt for another interesting question for us to consider. Oh, Matt, I'm sorry, you're still on mute. Okay, let's try that again. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, this is a topic I'm actually excited to talk about is peer feedback, because it's a potentially powerful form of assessment. It's totally reasonable to think that faculty and administrators are gonna be thinking and asking about how can we incorporate assessment among, you know, methods that move accredited schools and programs beyond the student rating. And um, there's, a, there's two huge advantages to peer feedback. The first one, I noticed a comment earlier in the chat saying something about low response rates, which is always a concern with student feedback. Um, with peer feedback, it's not an issue. So that's it, it's something that addresses that issue. And another great advantage is that um, responding, it's perfectly reasonable to think that students who respond to course evaluation are different from those who do not respond. That has done away with peer feedback. And um, so in our report, we did include two general recommended approaches for going beyond student ratings. And one of them was peer feedback. The other was learning outcomes measurements. Um, several study findings that actually suggested that faculty do make changes to their courses based on constructive peer and expert feedback. And, but there's many considerations with the peer feedback model. Um, thinking about a well-defined outcome, uh, administrative support, we need some sort of observation form that's sort of standardized and, and assessing what we want to be assessing. Um, and this is also an interesting side note, is that the ASPPH put out a report in 2017, Innovations on Pedagogy, that summarized the survey that was conducted, and about a third of the respondent schools reported uh, peer review as a method of evaluation for promotion and tenure. So this seems like a potentially important possible um, assessment modality for assessing teaching effectiveness. Uh, but with this said, it requires significant planning and buy-in uh, and oversight 
Chicago, the way it works best at the centralized level. So there needs to be buy-in at an institutional level or, or maybe a department or school. And uh, consistent training of dedicated observers is very important. So we have some sort of reliability in our peer feedback model. So a question that I had for all of you that I would love to hear about because I have not been successful in implementing peer feedback as a form of um, feedback for students for, for teaching effectiveness, but what are potential barriers to implementation at all different levels, the department level, the school level, the institutional level, um, and ideas for strategies to overcome barriers and implement peer feedback. And I know that some of you listening probably have a model in your school where you use peer feedback. So we'd love to hear any sort of feedback you have about your experience with that. Time workload is a barrier. Additionally, who do you choose? You need to avoid friends. Yeah, I mean, I, and, th and those are it, those are very important issues that need to be addressed in the planning stages. I'm a biostatistician and I always try to focus on the planning stages. Uh, you can analyze data a thousand times, but you only get one shot at the design. And I think um, peer feedback is the same thing. You get one shot at the design of it. So, um, faculty need training to appropriately complete a peer evaluation. I've seen great variation in the quality of feedback and the quality of the written report. Yeah, so there needs to be some sort of um, systematic infrastructure and some sort of quality checks to make this work effectively. Uh, because I can see some of those issues coming up here. I, I missed one question. Uh, lack of dedicated observers or standardized tools. Yeah, so standardizing seems to be something essential to do. Um, workload issues, Ali chimed in, people that will do quality feedback and it's time consuming. Right, and so that's one of the barriers that I've observed is that if we were to implement a peer feedback model, it now becomes something else faculty need to do. And it's not really considered in a formal service requirement. So unless there's at least a per mental or school buy-in, I think there, there's some real barriers there to the workload that it presents. Um, another question, any thoughts about how the instructor of the next course in a sequence might be a source of peer feedback. For example, instructors finding that students are coming out of prerequisite courses particularly well or poorly prepared. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question. I think having faculty communicate with each other in, in a sequence is, there's a lot of benefits to that. Um, a thought I have with that in an idea I shared earlier about mixed methods would be an end of semester focus group might be something that would be useful to take that information and carry it forward to that next course or that next instructor. I think organizational barriers, contextual barriers, relational barriers, yeah, there, there are barriers on many levels here that need to be thought through and addressed. And currently, I mean, I, I have not seen peer feedback sort of systematically adopted as a, as a means of assessing teaching effectiveness I would love to see it happen. If I think sort of a combination of both student feedback and peer feedback would, would be very informative. Is there any, has anyone ever thought on how you've been able to overcome some of these barriers in your institution to implement peer feedback? Matt, this is Ella. One strategy that I have thought might be effective, we haven't implemented this yet, but I was thinking about is having people, having faculty who have undergone the peer review or peer feedback process talk about what it felt like. I think that so many faculty are scared of the process because it sounds scary to have someone come and sit in your classroom tell you all the things you do wrong, which I mean, we know that's not the point of peer feedback, but I think there's that, that, you know, sort of gut feeling, oh, people will see me. And if, you know, if faculty can report out about what the experience was like to have someone in their classroom uh, providing constructive feedback on their teaching, I think that could really help to lower um, 
maybe some of those relational barriers or just that that own you know emotional barrier that people have to being critiqued I think we're uh, out of time to move on to the next topic and I think it's going to talk to us about something we're all familiar with which is uh, <laughs> Uh. Yes, so, um, you know, as, as we were writing this report and as we, you know, as Ellie noted, there isn't a great deal of um, literature on uh, course and teacher evaluation specifically within public health, but it did get us thinking about the fact that there's a different uh, sort of evaluation, if you will, that we all participate in every seven years, which is uh, the CEEF reaccreditation process. And so we went to the CEEF criteria, specifically the 2016 CEEF criteria, to look to see if there was anything related to uh, course and teacher evaluation. And uh, we saw that in the faculty instructional effectiveness section, uh, there are actually several uh, requirements that CEEF asks, asks us in our uh, self-studies and in our site visits to reflect upon. And so we started thinking about, okay, how can we find a synergy between what we can do in the classroom and as individual instructors that is also going to be useful, not just for improving our courses, improving our instruction, improving student learning, but also for demonstrating to CEEF that we are working to prepare our students to enter the public health workforce. So thinking specifically about uh, the measures of faculty currency, and then there's a whole section on faculty instructional technique that CEEF asks us to report on. I do think it's very telling that if you look at this bulleted list, student satisfaction with instructional quality, what we would think of as our typical uh, course evaluation that students complete at the end of the semester is actually at the very bottom of that list. So even in what CEEF is asking us to think about, uh, we're, it's, you know, they're pushing us to think more holistically about how we evaluate um, our instructional effectiveness and our student learning. And so my question is, how can we work to find sort of this synergy or this alignment between course and teacher evaluations and what CEEF is asking us to gather so that we're not doing additional data collection for CEEF, but that we're actually uh, maybe reflecting in a different way on data that we're already collecting uh, when we are doing our self-study or our site visit to be able to demonstrate to CEEF. So I'm curious to hear um, people's thoughts on this. So Ella, as everyone has a chance to sort of type in, um, I, I actually was typing in a question. I figure I'll just ask it since yeah. I get to speak. <laughs> so you uh, <laughs> when you were when you were mentioning this, it actually um, it made me think back to what Matt was saying about peer feedback, because mm -hmm. these frequency of internal quality reviews and participation in in um, professional development and peer evaluation is actually listed there. And for previously, some of the barriers were this institutional buy-in. So this might, using these criteria, might be a good um, sort of selling point for administrators to set up the system of peer feedback, um, which might take some of the problems of who do you pick? Um, you can't pick your friends. I don't wanna ask someone for a favor, right? So if it comes sort of um, as an institutional um, process, maybe that helps with some of those barriers we were seeing before. Right, and, and you know, ideally with faculty buy-in as well, just the idea of, you know, I don't want someone evaluating me. And, you know, if we can demonstrate that it's actually something that our accrediting body is, you know, looking for us to do, perhaps that could increase um, buy-in. Uh, let's see. So we need to elevate the importance of education in our environments to be as important as the research initiative. Yes, true story. Um, most faculty are content experts expected to become excellent teachers by osmosis. This is absolutely true. 
Um, and so maybe turning to some of the other uh, faculty instructional techniques here that Seif is pointing to, particularly with regard to professional development um, related to instruction, to address the fact that most of us were not ever trained as teachers. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great idea. Are there other thoughts about how uh, we can start to build structures uh, within our schools and programs that meet these two needs of both um, improving educational quality and doing so in a way that we can demonstrate it clearly to see? I think that pilot evaluations can help to validate and ensure standard data collection framework. Okay. Yeah, so thinking again, like uh, what Matt was referencing earlier, the idea that you only get one chance to design things. So you need to design robust systems that uh, you know, seem to have some reliability and validity um, from the very beginning. Um, Allie, is this your question that you? No, I'm sorry, I typed in a new one. Oh, okay, so a new question. <laughs> I'm hogging. I'm hogging the whole session. Uh, <laughs> I'm fascinated. Uh, I was just trying to think of when we, as we set up systems, and this is going to lead into the next topic, which I'll get to lead at. Uh, also, is are there certain worries? So you're an associate dean. Are there certain worries you have about structure? Are, are there things you think when as people start to think about setting up a structure at a departmental or a college level? Are there things that immediately you think we need to worry about this, or this is what we need? or we need to do this? Are there, are there certain factors there? So for, for me, because we are in the very beginning stages, we have a relatively new dean, and one of the first things that he put forth was that he would like to see a peer, um, uh, a, a peer evaluation you know, uh, structure in place specifically as it relates to CIF and being able to demonstrate um, you know, our, our uh, faculty uh, instructional effectiveness um, and and the first thing that came to mind was buy-in so for me it really you know we've got actually in the literature there are some really um, you know uh, robust descriptions of how to design effective um, peer evaluation um, procedures for instance as uh, one example um, but the idea of of getting buy-in in a way that you know allows that to move forward and that's true for any of these you know we we don't have to worry about buy-in with end of semester evaluations because they just come out whether or not we say this is you know how i want to be evaluated in the classroom we don't you know really control that in any way but thinking about you know how to build in additional systems when as one of the the commenters pointed out you know we first have to build build a structure in which education is valued equally with research <laughs> that's step one and then move from there to really demonstrate the importance of um, instructional effectiveness and how it can contribute to student learning i think it's probably time to turn it back over to you ali for the big wrap up <laughs> <laughs> thank you we have uh one more one more topic to go but i think if you've seen what we've tried to do across the session is sort of going from sort of immediate more individual to sort of higher and higher levels so our last topic really has to do with institutional change and as we've been monitoring the chat we we, we heard some about the sort of inflexibility that can occur at the institutional level so in the longer term, if we want to make differences, we, we will want to overhaul processes of evaluation at an institutional level um, for there to be these, so that, that it's not just on an individual faculty member to make changes in their evaluation system, um, if we can make some level that the, make some changes at the institutional level. So um, this is our, our last topic before our, our wrap up today. and. And the question is really thinking about this institutional level change. Who, who are the people that we need to connect with and, and what data are needed and do we have those data? So, uh, you know, we're all working with um, administrators who, who need to be convinced when changes need to be made, um, as we all do. If we're gonna make a change, we need 
we need um, data or information. So what is it that you all would need to make a, um, a strong case to make institutional change? And who are the individuals that we need to connect with? As we think about really wanting to have our report mean something, I think it, it needs to permeate not only faculty, but institutions as well. Um, so, uh, deans of faculty affairs, I'm seeing from coming from the chat, the president of the university, um, SACS reps, um, uh, SACS, uh, which is an accrediting body for schools, um, and a suggestion to connect with centers for teaching and learning on campus. You know, that topic actually hasn't come up today, the centers for teaching and learning, and they're really important um, in terms of providing resource um, for um, faculty members and also um, have an ear to the administration. Um, regional accrediting bodies need to be convinced. So our university continues to do things the way they do because the accrediting body requires it, right? And so I know it's hard to convince people to do more than just the minimum required. So again, I think this might be where that data plays into mind. Um, among the connections that we need to strengthen is with educational associations, um, connecting with AACU and regional accreditors. So on the good side of accreditation, right, it usually pushes people forward at an institutional level because they want to remain, um, they want to remain accredited. So that makes sense. But if the accreditation standards don't help us, then that's a problem. But but potentially we can look at accrediting standards and see how they can make it more useful. As Ella was just talking about in her topic, by connecting sort of the PT and R teaching evaluations, but connecting them to, to um, CEF accreditation standards, that could be a really good case to make. Um, so there's a need to better incentivize evaluations, um, having maybe sponsored awards for innovation and evaluation and learning. So we, we reward people for uh, a lot of times in, innovations in teaching, but what about evaluations? That's a really smart idea. Um, and, and how would we, so there was, sorry, that was a long note, that was me reading. Um, so, so in the report, it was noticed that people don't engage with these centers for teaching and learning as was just suggested. So again, how do we make those um, connections clearer? Um, a lot of our universities, here's another suggestion, universities have experts in the School of Education or a College of Education um, who maybe you could bring those on as consultants to try to improve the process. Um, course certifications or professional development um, might be um, ideas for um, enhancing institutional change. Um, ASPPH, right? So an organization we all know well, right? We can try to get it clearly, you know, articulated, which is part of what this working group is about. And th there's other working groups working on related topics to try to really enhance the importance of the education side. Um, as someone said, the educational side is just as important as the research side. Um, so that could be a really important role. And as someone else mentioned, um, ASPPH, one of the real excellent roles that they could play is coordinating collection of common data elements that everybody can use um, and can be aggregated across the schools. And that provides sort of a benchmarking, which also helps with when we were talking about comparative data very early on in the topic one area. So again, I think it does make a lot of sense that ASPPH has a role to play here, particularly in public health education. So I think those are really good points. Um, sorry, I'm just looking back and seeing if I missed anyone's comments. Okay, I don't see any. Um, so another um, idea was to honor teaching experts as champions. Faculty love to hear from other faculty, incentivize them in that role. I think that's a really good idea. Um, I want, I, and also that also shows sort of institutional investment in education um, because uh, the awards would probably come from, from the institutional level. Um, and I agree that faculty love hearing from faculty, um, is why peer feedback, which we've talked about uh, a couple times today, um, can make a really um, big difference. So I think those are all really great comments. So thank you. Um, so I think we can move um, on to sort of our uh, synthesis of the discussion. So 
first off, I wanted to just acknowledge that there was a, there was a lot of chat coming in, which we really appreciate. Um, we were, I will be all truth in advertising now, we were a little nervous about this format in hopes that we could create this interactive environment and you all were so helpful with, with participating um, actively in the chat. So thank you so much. If we missed your chat, we did read it. So you'll get a chance at the end to see our email addresses. So if you wanna connect with us further, um, we just didn't have time to answer everyone's um, chat comments. So thank you for that. So it's, it's sort of my job to, to try to synthesize this discussion um, in terms of, of themes. So I think to me, some themes that I, I heard throughout was, was one thing was to tie um, student course and teacher evaluations to actual student learning. And we heard about lots of ideas for do that in different ways, but the idea to take it away from rating scales and Likert scales and put it more into the feet of student learning can be very helpful for dealing with many of those things. Um, I know there were some concerns about these open-ended qualitative approaches that were being suggested because of response rates. So again, I think we can think creatively about it. And if we were gonna do some Let's say we wanted to um, look at some student learning pre and post. We could do an open-ended essay exam question. So students are going to be answering that open-ended question and then asking a similar question at the end of the semester and looking at the change. Um, so that is one way where you can get some qualitative data, which was um, in the chat was mentioned a bunch, but also not having to worry necessarily about the problems with response rates. Setting expectations and anchors was another theme that I really heard um, in terms of, of making sure that we are providing anchors to students if we're going to, you know, we're still having to use these uh, regular student course and teacher evaluations, but also setting up expectations, right? Can we, we mention that there are biases involved in these, so we bring it to the consciousness of the student. Um, so I think sort of using those um, are important. Um, along with the qualitative methodology for students, I heard that mentioned a couple times for faculty as well, in terms of using faculty reflections and open-ended peer observations um, in order to um, get meaningful um, feedback and, and evaluative information. Um, Another suggestion I think could fit across multiple domains was using simulations. So this was to take a bit of the scariness away from peer feedback, but I also think simulations could help in multiple um, domains. Um, it could be actually sort of like a simulation, um, a simulation um, of sort of the techniques that are used so students aren't worried about sort of these qualitative methodologies either. Um, and another important uh, theme I heard throughout was raising the importance of education. And so I can just encourage everyone here to be advocates for, for maintaining the importance of edu education across the spectrum. Um, so we, we really want um, chain, institutional change can start with individuals and we're hoping here that we're going to create some champions, as you guys mentioned, that can really um, bring education and um, strong course and teacher evaluative processes to the forefront. Um, and I'm sure that I am missing more themes, but those are the ones that really um, popped out at me. So again, I really appreciate your um, attention and um, focus on this webinar. And I'm going to turn it back over to Liz. Thank you, Ali. Uh, there is a, a little extra time for closing observations from all of you on the panel, if, if you would like to take advantage, uh, maybe two minutes, if there's anything else that you'd like to say in response to the chat items that came in or any closing remarks. Um, I just want to say thank you, Liz, for all of your help in organizing this session. And Ali, you've done a remarkable job as chairing this work group and the report. Um, I think these are some, there are some real challenges here to try to get at some valid ways to assess teaching effectiveness. So there's a lot of ideas in this report. I hope that some of them see the light of day. I would love to see more research studies about some of these methods and topics and more development of evidence that we can use for teaching effectiveness. So, 
but thank you all for the opportunity. And I just want to second uh, Allie in thanking everyone for participating. Uh, we were very concerned that it was going to be uh, like uh, the first day of class where you ask a question and everyone just sits there. <laughs> so it's been, um, it, it was actually a challenge to keep up with all of the comments in the chat box. So that was absolutely wonderful. Uh, it's clear that, that these are all issues that, you know, that, that we've thought a lot about and that we now need to turn into action. As we said, when we were you know, researching for this report, there's not a great deal of um, empirical literature out there that deals specifically with these issues in the context of public health education. And so I would encourage people to you know, start thinking about how we can document what it is that we do. We're all doing, um, you know, incredible things in our different schools and programs and we need to start documenting that uh, so that we can disseminate that and get that out for others to learn from and to implement in their own programs as well. Thank you, Ella, Matt, and Ali. Ali, did you have any final? No, I'm sure everyone's pretty sick of my voice by now. Thank you, Liz. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> Great. Well, I want to thank everyone who participated today, uh, who spent your time with us on this Friday afternoon. We really miss seeing you in person, but this is the next best thing. Hearty appreciation to our speakers. Their emails are here. I will send it out per a request. Uh, I'll send their emails and the report to all of you, if not today, early next week. Shortly after the webinar wraps up, we're going to have the archive version there on the website at the link there. For those of you who are certified in public health, we are offering one hour of continuing ed credit for participating in this webinar. I'd like to direct your attention to some work we've been doing these last couple months gathering from our member schools and programs resources that you are preparing and you've had uh, you've developed with community partners, health departments. We have posted these resources and your news on our website. A lot of really excellent free materials online for you to use in trainings and getting up to speed with this pandemic. You can see it at the link there. If you have an extra minute after the website concludes, there's a short evaluation and it'll pop up in your browser after we wrap up. We'd appreciate it if you could take a minute to weigh in and give us some advice on how to improve. So next year we have a milestone. ASPPH celebrates its 80th anniversary. So we invite you to mark your calendars for March 17th, 2021 which is the beginning of the ASPPH annual meeting and the undergraduate public health education summit, hoping you could join us. And until then, we are relaunching our ASPPH Presents webinar series next week. The first one is gonna be on mental health. It's May 21st at 1 p.m. Following that, we're gonna have a series, a double set of, uh, Superhero Survival Skills for Faculty, and that's on remote instruction, and the companion webinar, Sidekick Survival Skills for Faculty. So both on remote instruction, June 2nd and June 4th, both starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. The link below right there is where you can get more details and to sign up for these webinars. And there'll be much more going forward because this is how it's gonna be until we're able to get together in person again. This concludes the virtual 2020 ASPPH annual meeting. The webinar is adjourned. <laughs>